Okay. Ready. So, uh, is that okay? The volume is fine? Great. Um, well, Steady Lisa, that's the thing we've been doing for the last two and a half years. So, I'm going to take you through a journey that I've lived all my life and why I landed here in, in Steady Lisa, basically. Um, You will notice through the presentation that my main uh, language is not English, so if I stumble in some words, never worry, it's normal. Um, I'm going to show you, first of all, my family, because this is important, not just for my story, but for like the sake of doing something with uh, children here in Yucatan, I think so. Um, that's my mom over there, Mari Carmen, and um, she's... She's not here now, she's in Mexico City, and I would love her to be here because she's very important. She taught us to be um, empathetic about everything. She's like the most loving, caring uh, person that I know. She's very unusual. She never fights over anything. She takes care of everything and everybody. And that's something that when, when you see that, as your children, it uh, changes you, the way you see the world. Um, in the middle, it's my father, it's Armando. He passed away 18 years ago. But uh, when we, he was alive, he taught us many things that I think are very important. Um, he used to enjoy in a very special way, like nature and staring at the stars and camping, like we spent most of our childhood like doing that for years and years and I never understood we, like if we couldn't pay a hotel or something like that because we should go like to these very far away places and just like camp in the middle of nowhere and be there for six days and take care of uh, like local animals like just adopt a dog or uh, feed like a uh, turtle or you know like things very weird things that in time made sense for me not when I was a child but now they make a lot of sense and here is my sister that she grew up with me in the same uh, family and she turned out to be a very sensitive person she loves her pets more than anything in the world and um, through her journey she uh, taught us to be vegan, because once you do that much for animals, once you uh, work uh, and, and think all your life about what's good from the environment and um, how you can help more and what else you can do and what other pet or animal you can save, you end up being like very uh, special about this. So she made us vegan. And now we cannot eat animals anymore because of her. So she's a very important part of the story, you know. Um, so then I want to talk about my studies. And, and not because, like, what I learned in school, but um, when I was really young, we moved from Mexico City to a place called Morelia, which is in, Yuc in uh, Michoacan. And uh, somehow I ended in a school called, called SEM which is Centro Educativo Morelia, nothing important. But the thing about this school is that they um, center everything in this school uh, uh, and in three main ideas, respect, responsibility, and freedom. All of these based on environmental care. So I think from um, middle, like, like, three or four years of my life I spent in that school, and I never learned about math, or science, or Spanish, or English, or anything else. I just like spent most of the time gardening, and uh, we took one or two trips a, week, a, a year with school to take care of sea turtles, and uh, to go to ad, um, campaigns to adopt dogs, or to help 
in some other manner in like a field or plant trees or you know like all these experiences that had nothing to do with the real world that we've been taught that we have to learn things um, but that's what I learned when I was really young and it stuck it stuck with me I learned to like um, separate trash which was nothing in my house, but when I came from school, I said, we'll have to put this apart from this, and we cannot mix this uh, bag with this uh, can, and, and everybody was like, so what? What happens with that? And that becomes really important in the story because um, I think what is wrong here in Yucatan and in Mexico is that when, when kids go to school or they spend like time in their houses or anything, it's like they don't get to know what's really important. We're living in a, in a, in a world that it's very connected and everything is uh, commercial and everything is about um, making more money or being more successful. But what's really important is to take care of the things that surrounds us, like nature, it's becoming very important, every single day more important, because if we destroy that, if we don't care about that, it's going to be over. So for me, this upbringing was crucial. I learned the importance of being in touch with the surroundings, with everything that is around me. Um, this is the only picture that I found from when I used to go to the beach. <laughs> to save turtles because, you know, like 40 years or so ago, there were no like cameras everywhere. But this place become very special for me. Like, um, it reminds me things that I cannot do anymore because they don't even happen that much. When I just arrived to, to Yucatan, I, I found out that they have beaches where, where turtles come to nest. And I was like, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna to relieve all these things that happened to me when I was a child. And I went and I got to see like two turtles in two nights. And then you realize like it's been only like 40 years or like 30 something years. And there's not much else to see. That, what, that for me was sad because you never think like in like part of your life everything is gonna start to disappear and it's starting um, so this upbringing these lessons all these things that I saw when I was a kid I think they made me the person that I'm now and they made me care as much as I care to get up and do something about it because that's what I think people lacking like the interest of participating. So um, I'm gonna move now to the part of the story where Stelisa starts to appear. Then um, we have to move from like my 12 year old kid to 30 year old. Um, but I, but this time I'm in Mexico City, living as always, um, and. Um, we used to help a lot of dogs, uh, you know, like rescues or the one that passes by you on the street and you pick up and you're trying to find a new home for them. Um, but it was really a burden to try to help them all because it's very expensive. And somehow we ended up um, finding these um, units, these sterilization units that Apparently, where they were paid by the government, it was a government program. They existed all around the city. There were like thousands of them. But the thing is that nobody knew. They were like there, free, with amazing services, with amazing vets, but nobody knew they, were, they existed. So uh, we found that, and then uh, obviously we started taking like every single dog or cat we saw on the street to these units, like was the, the thing to do. 
So we kind of started like relating with the vets that worked there. And um, one of the things that came to my mind when I was going to these places, to these units, was like, why is this empty all the time? Like every time I come with a cat or a dog, there's no people waiting out at all. Like every single time I come, I go in, and 20 minutes later, I'm out with my whatever, you know? So, um, obviously, as I'm very curious, I got to talk with Eduardo, which is now the main vet from Esterilisa. He was in one of these units. He's, he's, he's still there, but they don't work um, for free anymore. Um, and I ask him, like, why is this empty all the time? What happens? And he told me, well, we have all the resources. We have the units. We have, like, very trained vets. We have every single med that we need, like, everything. But um, the government makes no promotion. It makes no fuss about it. Nobody knows. So I thought, well, instead of spending, like, 2,000 pesos or 3,000 pesos in one surgery in, like, any clinic, why don't I spend that money in promoting these things? I mean, if I get to spend 2,000 pesos and fill these things with people, then instead of doing one surgery, I'm going to do, like, 100, 200? I don't know. So we tried. And uh, after 15 days of doing this through Facebook with, like, I think I paid, like, 50 pesos for each unit. They were packed. We went there, and there was no room for new surgeries, like, packed all the time. So I decided, like, where should I put my money? Like, should I have one dog or one cat, or should I fill these things? And that was really obvious for me. We did that for like 10 years straight, because that existed. People wanted to take their dogs, their pets, or like the ones they found on the street. So that was a that was a, an option, like a very good one. Um, then 2020 came. COVID, we all know that happened. Everything closed. Um, the units closed. It was it was not going anymore, like anywhere, like there were no uh, units working. And obviously my, my business as well closed. So um, I decided to come to Yucatan to see if what, there was something else to do here, at least like to spend like the pandemic here and try to be next to the sea or nature or whatever, instead of Mexico City, which was as always like packed with cars and everything. Um, and um, what I thought coming here, because I, I have been here, had been here for like a few times, a few days each time, and I never got to go around and see what was happening in Yucatan. <laughs> I wouldn't have come here if I knew, for sure. But um, we came here, and I thought, well, this is a tiny place, less people, there's not going to be dogs outside running around or run over on the streets. No more cats, no more suffering, no more nothing. Until we found this. Like every single time I used to go out, um, I couldn't bear what I saw. It's like dogs everywhere, cats everywhere, littles, every, littles like, you know, like, like puppies. It's amazing. And it's not just like dogs lying around. It's like, like dogs really sick, like spreading diseases, um, being treated awful. Like I found things, pieces of inf information like, and I don't know if this is still like real now, but at that time, Yucatan was the number one uh, case of dog raping. Like, that's a thing, that's a thing. It happens that much, they count it. So, um, when, I, when I saw this, I was devastated. I actually thought of going back to Mexico because I was so overwhelmed, so sad, 
of seeing like all this happening. Like if you go to a cenote, you will see dogs there. If you go to a town to have some food, you will see dogs there. If you go to the beach, you will see dogs there suffering. So like it's constant. It's not like in anyone, like anybody in any other place that I've been, it's this bad. So um, I'm gonna take you through some numbers that I research through this journey and it's really like, bad for me. Like this is the crisis in Yucatan. 10 out of every seven dogs end up out on the streets. So 70% of the dogs that are born end up on the streets and that's huge. Um, it's estimated that there are around 100,000 dogs in the street situation in the region. So 100,000, it's like if we each like there's, I think, 900,000 households in Yucatan. So like if everybody takes 10 dogs, there's not enough houses for them. So that's the situation. So you know, like adopting a dog, it's really nice, it's beautiful, it's the best thing you can do, but there's other nine for you on the street. That's, that's real. Um, other numbers are, that are like outrageous is like the offspring of a female dog, it's five years amounts to more than 28,000 puppies. Of course, you'll say like, if they were that much, we would see like 10 times the amount we see on the streets. Well, the thing is that like 90% of that or even more, they die really soon. They get sick, they get run over, they get eaten, they, die, they, they starve to death. So, I mean, that's a way of nature to control this amount of dogs, but still, it's very sad. And, well, cats, it's even worse. We don't get to see them because they are really good at hiding, but it's even worse. Like, they cannot even count it because it's outrageous. Um, so, here, I tried to set a slide with the amount of cats that you would see like from one female cat after five years and it just like kept turning on off. The computer was like, this is too much cats for me. So um, here there are like just thousand kitties, but kittens, but you would need like thousand, like another thousand screens to, to see the amount of cats born from just one female cat after five years. That's how many animals are born like everywhere all the time without getting noticed. Like if you get to go to the places that we go, uh, like these dumpsters in uh, Subinkanka or uh, the beach side by Cisal, you would be crying. It's like 2,000 dogs over there. 2,000. That's, that's a real number. Um, so what contributes to this situation the most? Um, the lack of accessible and affordable sterilization programs, which is more than evident now with the experience we have. Um, the problem lies in economic capacity. Many people have to choose between eating and caring for their pets. And this is awful to say, but it's real. I mean, people have to choose between if they're going to eat or their pets are going to eat. They have to choose between them having something in their houses or like taking care, taking care of their pets. And it's, I mean, we've learned through this journey that it's not that they don't care about their pets. It's not that they don't want to help them. They cannot. That's, that's real and, and we have to, I mean, I'm, I'm Mexican. I was born in Mexico and I didn't know that people really cannot pay for like uh, food or like a vaccine. I, I, I didn't know that and, and it amazes me because I should have known, I should have known. Um, the other factor that it's very important for me, and um, it's something that we've been working on as well, 
is the lack of awareness about the responsibility of pet ownership. And this is because nobody taught us, taught us empathy and that life is not for sale. And what I, why, why I try to um, say and, and with this specific um, idea is that we've been in tiny towns, in very faraway places, dealing with the worst situations, but also we've been in, for example, Las Americas. And many people ask me, like, why do you go there? People can pay for a surgery there. People can afford for their animals. And that's true, but they don't. They don't, and uh, taking your pet to a uh, uh, clinic, sometimes it's like 3,000 pesos, 4,000 pesos. And even though they can, it's not a uh, priority. It's not something on the top of the list. They have other expenses, they have other things to do with their money. And it's understandable. I mean, we're not the richest country in the world, so we have to choose sometimes what do we spend on. Um, and I don't know if you've seen, but when I go around, and I get to go to uh, Cenote somewhere really far from Merida, and then I get to see like a uh, Dash Hound or a uh, Great Dane. It's like, where did this dog come from? <laughs> how, how, how come? And of course, I mean, I've seen this happen because I've seen it with my neighbors. Like in Country Club, they breed their dogs, a beautiful, dog like like any any breed you like and then they sell half of them or all, most of them but then one or two end up in the hands of the gardener or the maid and of course they're taking those dogs because they want to make money out of them and it's understandable because people need money uh, in the end, what happens is they have this dog, they cannot take care of it, they end up on the street like every other single dog, they reproduce, and then you have these weird situations going on. And this is because uh, middle class and upper middle class, they don't also care about their pets. They don't know, they, they have to fix their dogs, fix their cats, and stop reproducing their animals because it's not healthy for any of us like the society their animals or anything there's plenty of dogs out there if they want more puppies just like drive 10 minutes and you will find a litter lying everywhere that's normal in yucatan um the lack of accessible and affordable sterilization programs which is now more evident with our accumulated experience. This issue lies in economic capacity. Many individuals have to choose between feeding themselves and caring for pets, that I said. Um, the lack of awareness regarding the responsibility of pet ownership. This stems from a lack of empathy education where the value of life is not understood to be something that can be bought and sold. And that's that relates with the, just the thing that I just said. Like, if we uh, only spay and nurture dogs, if we only um, take care of that, we're, we're addressing part of the problem. But the thing is that we take care of these pets, we take care of these animals, and we can stop that from happening. Like, like telling your neighbor that they have to go and fix their uh, pets is important, like transmitting all this information to other people to let them know that it's not okay to breed animals like crazy. It's not normal. It shouldn't happen. Um, so it's very important to address the issue of the growing population of homeless animals in Yucatan through low cost or free sterilization programs, extensive education initiatives and the promotion of responsible pet ownership. I'm pretty sure you're all aware of that. That's why you're here, <laughs> mainly because you care. But um, I care. And what I try to do every single day is to convince other people they have to care through 
uh, examples through the work that we do with Stelisa and through um, being empathetic because that's very important. First, when I just came here, I was very angry, like yelling at people, like telling them like they shouldn't behave like that. And I understood that that's not the way because most of the people, they do what they do because they don't know better. So we have to be empathetic and try to tell them what's better, what's a better behavior, what's a better way to relate with their pets, which is taking care of them. Um, just other like really bad numbers, like uh, this is according to the Mexican Association of Veterinary Specialists and in Small Animals, which is very large name for a vet society. And they estimate that we have around 23 million stray dogs in Mexico, like in the whole country. So that means like if every Mexican adopts one dog, we will have one for like the 70% of the population. Like 70% of the population could adopt one dog now and that or will that would stop the problem today. But for sure, tomorrow there will be more on the street because that's how we work. Um, Yucatan is not better. So according to Yucatan Health Secretary, and this is this number, it's not new, it's very old because they don't count that much. I mean, it's just dogs, so they don't count. Um, they say there are like 50,000 dogs and cats roaming the streets of Merida and their municipalities um, inside the state. So in, in proportion, with a count of 9,000 households, we could need to adopt 5.5 dogs in each house to remove all the dogs from the streets. So you see that's not possible. That's, I mean, my mom has six. She's done her part, but still. <laughs> so um, the situation is not good. And these are the things that I got to see when I landed in Yucatan, when I started to going around and thought, well, this is like hell for me. I shouldn't be here. <laughs> um, like, um, I get a lot asked this. Like, why don't you go and talk to the government? They should do something about it. And I, I also think that. But we have to be real. I mean, one thing is that we, again, are in a not so rich country. So they have other big issues to take care of, you know. Uh, but also they think they're doing something. So now um, they have this mobile sterilizer unit. They inaugurated it uh, on April 22nd, 22. Uh, they offer services such as sterilization, vaccination, medical care, and uh, other services, like smaller services. Uh, so I went there to the office and I asked, well, what's happening with these units? What's happening with the hospital that you set up? What's happening with the programs that you have set for all the situation in the, country, in, the in the state? First of all, these programs are not for the state, are just for Merida. They're for the city, and uh, they're for small pets. You have to go there, you have to make an appointment, and they have a limit. They have a limit of 200 surgeries a month. That's nothing. If you saw the numbers that I just like talked about, 200 surgeries is nothing. And also, half of these services are not working now. So, if you wanna go there, So, if you want to go there and make an appointment and try to get your animal fixed, that's not going to happen. I tried, and I couldn't. And I'm not blaming the government. I'm just appointing that 
the things they are doing, the things they have the money for, are not enough. They're not there for all the people. And they're not there for the real situation that is happening. So it's, it's sad, but it's true. Um, so basically, it's a failed program. For me, it's failed because as usual, they spend them that amount of money they spend in a mobile unit in just surgeries. But they don't subcontract people that they know what to do. They want to do it themselves. Um, um, with this happening, well, they spent like almost two years building a unit. They spent another six months getting the permits and the plates. And now they're waiting for the permits to drive around and be able to use it. And the administration is about to be over. So they're not gonna be able to use it. And maybe the next one that comes, they won't even care about animals. So it's really sad when it's that's the truth. We have to do something about it because we cannot wait for the government to act on it. Um, I am not being political at all. I don't mind, I don't care about parties. This is not a political situation. It's just like they are not addressing the problem. They're not um, making up laws to stop this from happening. Although, I got a message this morning from a friend, uh, from Mr. Lisa, which is a congressman, that helps a lot in the process of getting um, places to perform the surgeries, uh, permits, He's been very helpful. I have to say that some of the people that are in, the in the government, they care a lot. And this guy texted me this morning, like not this morning, like around one o'clock, and he said like next week they're passing a law that is gonna make uh, punishable if you mistreat uh, uh, pet, basically. So if you see something happening to a dog, now you're gonna be able to call special police, and they will come, and they do something. So that's gonna happen next week, hopefully, but then we will see if it works, because normally it sounds good, sounds better than, than it is. Um, so in addition to this very bad situation, we have also all, all the problems that come with it, which are diseases and health conditions. And this, um, this is terrible for the dogs, obviously, but this is something that I always try to tell people that don't like dogs. Why? Because when I tell my friends or other people that I do all this, they're always like, why do you spend that much money and that much time in helping dogs? So I know they don't care about dogs. So I try to tell them, well, if you don't like dogs, you don't like them to walk to you with ticks and fleas, or sick, or uh, starving and asking you food. So this is not a problem for the people that like pets or dogs or cats. It's a problem for everybody. You know, like Progreso used to pay campaigns before because the cruise lines uh, told them to. They said if you don't pay to address this problem, we won't bring any more people here in cruises because people from other countries don't like to see dogs starving to death lying on the streets. And that's the only thing why they pay these campaigns. They stop now because they don't care anymore. They don't really care, but um, it is a problem. So, what kind of diseases, and I'm just gonna go through this very fast because it's, we've seen it. Scabies, which is uh, transmitted by mites. The disease causes several dermatological problems. Scabies, it's terrible. I think like every single dog on the street, they have this. There's, we've seen like all of them have scabies. Or they had scabies, or they will have scabies because it happens a lot. Fleas and ticks, that's also like every single dog that has no owner or has like a, this 
owners that they have a house, but it lives on the street. Fleas and ticks are everywhere. So these parasites come on street dogs that can cause discomfort and transmit serious diseases such as rabies or uh, other diseases. Um, rabies potentially, and these are the the cases like this one we get to see all the time. That's normal. When we get to see those dogs, and people is like, are you gonna be able to spay that one because he's really bad? And it's like, well, he lives in the street. That's his condition. I mean, as we better do as much as we can for them because eventually he's gonna die from scabies. Nobody's gonna do anything about it. Um, rabies, which I thought it was control, it's not anymore. And that's deadly for animals and that's transmitted all to humans, so very dangerous. Uh, distemper, which is a serious disease that affects the respiratory and digestive system, especially dangerous for puppies due to its high mortality rate. Mortality rates. These, uh, like, I was showing Martha before we come, we came here. Like, now, in this moment, I have 5,071 messages in the WhatsApp that we use for staying visa. I can tell you, like, for sure, 20% of that is like, my dog just had a litter, and then uh, six out of seven are behaving really weird. They're starting to tremble, and their, uh, their nose is dripping, so, those dogs are gonna die in a terrible manner because we went there a month ago and this one lady didn't want the female pregnant dog to want to be uh, fixed because, you know, like religion here is very important and she was pregnant and she was gonna be a mom. So it's better for those puppies to be born and they get really sick and suffer for like a week and die in the most terrible manner. So this is something that we get to see every single time we go outside. Like I see this every day, every single day. I, I cannot go one day without seeing these situations happening to one dog. So this is everywhere, all the time. Um, leptospirosis, this is a kidney disease. It's not that common, but it's, it happens a lot, and it is transmissible to humans. So, so the, the bad thing about not getting vaccines, and uh, the, bad, the bad thing about vaccines being, being that expensive is that, I don't have a count, but I would say like 95% of dogs here in Yucatan have no vaccines. None, like not even one. Not rabies, no nothing. So when you go to a clinic and they tell you like, oh, you have a litter and you have eight dogs, eight puppies, and each vaccine is gonna be 800 pesos times eight times four vaccines, it's not gonna happen. So that's real. Uh, Rickettsia is transmitted to humans with teeth bites, meat flights or lice. Um, Leptospirosis, which is another one contracted through contact with the urine of infected animals. And uh, one that you might have seen or you might know, uh, TBT, which is a type of cancer. It's transmitted uh, to uh, sexual behavior. And uh, you might see it. It's this case here. Uh, this year, this year. I don't know if you can see, but we, when you get to see a female dog with like everything swollen and like popping out like a, like a broccoli, bleeding, that's TBT. When you get to see a dog with like all the situation like inflamed and bleeding as well, that's TBT. And then it gets very contagious. When another dog smells that dog, when that dog lies on the floor and bleeds, and another dog smells that blood, it gets uh, 
contagion. So um, most of these things are curable or treatable with vaccines, but it's expensive as well. So we also try to um, give vaccines to people like in the cheapest way. We get to buy vaccines from the <coughs> labs and then we go around and vaccinate dogs and vaccinate cats between campaigns. And uh, we buy uh, Bing Cristina, which is the medicine for TBT, and we give it away to people that cannot afford it. Because, you know, like trying to stop the suffering is the main thing here. Um, so that's the worst scenario. Now I'm going to talk to you about how Stelisa was born. <laughs> um, this started with my mom, actually. As I told you, she's very, very, very sensitive about, the, about these things. And um, she once called me and she said, well, I have to do something about it. I cannot see this and do nothing anymore. I have to do something. So I got um, with these ladies, these neighbors, and I'm going to have a coffee with them. Could you please come and, and try to participate and see if we get any ideas. And obviously I said yes, I've been there. And uh, I think I spent one hour listening to, uh, um, I think there were like 10 uh, ladies there. Like, what kind of coffee do you want? Are you gonna <laughs> have a cookie? And, and they were trying to plan like an adoption center and a rescue place, and a system to get foster homes. Um, so I thought, this is not what's needed. I mean, there's plenty of that. There's a lot of that happening already. It's uh, amazing what all these rescuers do, but it's like, for me, taking uh, an aspirin for a cancer, you know? like. You have that dog. There's too much happening. So I obviously, I obviously needed something else. So um, I said to my mom, yes, I'm going to help, but I'm not going to do anything of that. I'm not going to buy a piece of land and put a fence and then collect 1,000 dogs that we find in the street and put them like in a kind of a jail and feed them for years and years. and. I mean, I know for like most of the people that's something reasonable for me as well, but it's happening. So why do the same? So I thought we have to do something about fixing animals. For me, that's the only thing that really stops the problem, that cuts the problem from the roots and stops animals from being born. That's the only solution. So uh, we needed a name. We needed an idea. We needed a plan. We needed everything because we never done it before. So um, I came up with the name Stelisa, which is two words in Spanish, two female names that mean sterilization altogether. So Ster and Lisa are like. That's, that's very easy to understand. Apparently not, because many people comes on the clinic and tells like, who is Esther and who is Lisa? <laughs> None of us. It's just like the word. But uh, we had a name about that time. We had an idea. And uh, that's enough. Uh, For several days, but this time I dedicated myself to thinking about what was the best thing we could do. Um, we decided, on, like my mom and I, because basically that, that's where it started. My mom decided like sterilizing is the thing that we did in Mexico with no money, with almost no money, with no experience. I think we can do that. We can do that here. Um, and then, you know, like, like sometimes you have like these signs from the world that, that tell you what to do. 
And I read something that say, if you want to save thousand dogs, you have to sterilize one. And I thought, well, that's it. Let's do that. Let's do one sterilization. And then we can have help not being born by like thousand dogs. If that's an idea, that's a good one. So sterilization happened um, in a pair of words, and this appeared. Um, obviously, we didn't know what we were getting into at all. The first campaign we organized took place in two locations um, in one weekend. That was Comchen and Motul. Basically, what I did is I spoke to the chartered vets in Mexico City, a lot of them, and told him about the idea of sterilizing all the street dogs in Yucatan. That's what I said, because I thought that was easy. <laughs> He obviously laughed at me because, you know, like another crazy guy, another crazy idea, and that's not gonna happen because it's very complicated. Um, and I'm pretty sure he didn't laugh at me because uh, we've talked about it. And he said, like, I've got that call at least 15 times in my life. Like somebody wanted to do something about the place they live in. But in the end, it gets expensive, it gets tiring, it overwhelms you, and, and you really get to think, am I doing something? Because you do one dog, you stop a thousand being born, but then you go out and you get to see another 20 dogs there. So that's why most of the times this enthusiasm, this will to do something and it's really fast. Um, but Eduardo didn't know me that well. So finally after a month uh, and a half of planning this thing, um, the first clinic was happening. Um, so to force myself to not don't stop about this, I bought plane tickets, I paid for hotel, I rented a car for the vet, and I said, well, let's hope for the best. Um, <laughs> then it came to me how I, how I get the people to come to the clinic, how, how I convince the people to come here, because everybody told me nobody's going to pay for the clinic, nobody's going to pay for their pets, nobody's going to come and, 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 and show up. I mean, that's. That's the people from the rural places in Yucatan. Nobody cares. Well, let's see. So I posted an, a, a, a Facebook ad, and I said, we're going to have a clinic in Comchen. And this is the price for it. Uh, obviously, I couldn't pay for the whole thing. I could pay for the plane ticket, yes. I could pay for the hotel, yes. I could pay for the food, yes. I could pay for the car, yes. But I cannot pay for a hundred surgeries. It's impossible to me. So I, I had to charge the people for this. And uh, obviously, most of the people told me that's wrong because they don't have the money. And I thought, well, if they have the money to buy a beer, if they have the money to do other things that they do, just like entertainment, I'm pretty sure they can pay. 280 pesos. I think by that time it was 250 pesos. So, well, the worst thing that could happen is that nobody showed and it was a failure and then that's it. But that didn't happen. So I posted this ad on Facebook and I uh, used my phone number for the ad. Worst idea. I spent like, I had to spend my all my activities for a week, and I spent like a week answering the phone every single <coughs> minute of the day, like one call after another, and then I have to call back the people that couldn't answer during the call. It was crazy. And uh, with this, I found that people is willing to go, is willing to pay, and is willing to uh, have their pets in better condition. They just don't have the amount of money that clinics charge. And I'm not blaming the clinics. I know they're there for a reason. 
I know that they're and they work, but that's that's a reality for like a small amount of people that lives in this city, not for all, and not for all the states. So um, finally, the day came. Uh, the beds arrived in Merida. I uh, hosted them. Um, drove them around the city, showed them the place. We talked about everything but the clinic because I thought I had an idea of what I was doing. I didn't. <laughs> we went to sleep. I posted one last thing on Facebook and crossed my fingers and said, well, let this happen. Many people answered. Let's see if they show up. Uh, I can tell you that we were completely unprepared for what happened next day. Um, a disaster, definitely a disaster. When we arrived in Conchen this morning, uh, we found a line over a hundred people in line waiting for us, with dogs, cats, um, some of them with five dogs. It was like overwhelming and the worst thing is like I planned everything until the day they arrived from that point I have nothing else so we had no people to help we were like 10 in total with beds counting uh, we had no tables we had no chairs we had no racers we had like nothing so we were unprepared and um, I think the only thing that I learned from that day is that I met people, like really good people, that was as eager as we were to help. And that the people from Conchim would come back like any other time and wait in like 10 hours to pay for the dogs to be fixed. So, not that for, for a first day. Next day, we had to repeat because that was scheduled well. So uh, I think the first day we ended around eight o'clock at night. We started at nine, we uh, ended at eight. We were devastated. Um, we didn't eat anything. We sweat all day. We were running around. We were doing everything, all of us. And then we had to repeat on Saturday in, in Motul. And um, against all odds, against all the people saying that nobody's gonna show up, again, we uh, went there, we were, um, we had like 150 people in line. We had like plenty of things that we had to turn away because we had no time, no medicine, no anesthesia, no anything, like like anything wasn't enough. Um, after two days of campaign, which uh, ultimately were very successful because we accomplished more, much more than was expected. We did uh, over 200 surgeries just with that infrastructure, like nothing at all. Uh, we, realized, we realized that we didn't know anything, basically, but we could build a team, and uh, that people responded, and uh, and, the, and in the end, well, the 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 need is there, it's, it's it exists. So um, the vets took off to Mexico City, and then I spent like a week thinking we have to build this from the ground. I have no idea, but we have many, many opportunities to, to work with. Um, obviously, uh, after this chaotic weekend, the next step was to think about the next days. So that's that's the way I work. So once I start, I cannot stop. Even if it's not the best idea, I have to do, set a new day and feel the pressure of that happening again to be able to work under pressure and make things better. Um, so we have, like, I have 
had many, many things to think about, like how, how to target people, how to make appointments, um, how to make people not wait that long, how to um, attend more dogs and cats, like how many beds we need, how many tables we need, how many chairs we need, how many people shaving we need. Like we had to do everything from, from scratch because it was good, the idea was good. So from that day, which was um, June, July, July 2021, it's been two years and almost eight months, I think. Uh, we have never stopped. We have had one clinic after another every six weeks, and we've been growing and getting better every single time. And that's something I'm very proud because the people that I've met through this journey have made this happen better every single time. And just like the idea and the seed that um, started this, but there's many people that cares, and that's something that I didn't know what was, what was going to happen. Um, so uh, what was the challenge, actually? Because apparently, uh, spaying and nurturing is a challenge. And having less dogs on the streets is the challenge, and that's very obvious. But uh, apart from improving every single process and being uh, much more aware of um, what we were doing. Um, we had a very important opportunity that is influence on people and the way they see their pets. And um, that's a part of the story I'm gonna tell you later, but that idea came to my mind very soon with the Stereisa. Like we have to teach people how to be more empathetic, how to be more loving with their pets. Obviously, we were 10 with pets counted, so we had not enough people to transmit that message, but that's gonna come later. Um, we found the opportunity to raise awareness among people in society in general about what animal welfare entails. We have the opportunity to change not only the life of that animal, but the entire social environment. To improve health, to give advice that helps um, heal relationships between people and pets that have been totally misguided, to make people understand that their pet is their family. And um, after two and a half years or more, a few more months, I know this is real. People that get to go to the clinic and get to experience the way we treat their pets change the, their mindsets. They, um, they learn they're not things that um, live on the street outside their house. They, they, they get to learn they're kind of like family, you know? Like every single time we're in a clinic and we have to call for the owner, we never use the word owner. We use the family of Luna or the family of Cachito. And then people get to use these other words with their pets and learn their family. They're the family. And that starts to change the mindset of the people after they get to go to the clinic. Um, it's been only two and a half years or so, but we have consolidated the team, the name, the idea, and our presence within the state, and the format that we do things. And when I wrote this down, I thought this is not important at all. At all, we're not trying to make a brand. We're not trying to make a business. The, the only important thing is that the message that we sent out and the amount of uh, numbers that we do makes a difference. And that's why I care a lot of these numbers and a lot about this awareness. 
But the most exciting thing is that um, to see that there's, a, there's not a single day when we do not receive requests from, from various um, towns asking us to come because they want to help in their community. So, like, and I think when I say every single day, you will say like, that's impossible, but like every single day, I get a message asking, can you come to my community? I've heard of you. I know the amount of work you've done. I know how you treat pets, and I want you in my community. And it's a shame because we cannot go everywhere. We don't have that much money. We don't have that much time. We try to do as much as we can, but what we know is that, that there is much more uh, need that we can address. Um, so we've done. Um, I don't know if this is in the wrong yeah, way. Sorry. Okay. Here. Um, this is the numbers that we've done already: nine thousand seven hundred surgeries until February twenty twenty four. That's much more than I ever thought. Much more than I ever planned. Um, but obviously, uh, even that number is not enough. Many times I get to feel that um, I'm overwhelmed thinking about how much we have helped um, and if this has made a difference already or how much more we have to do to make a difference. Um, but then I get to go to these towns <laughs> between clinics and I get to see these dogs walking around and I even recognize them like that's the one we uh, spayed that time and that's the one we treated from TBT and uh, I've been to towns like in another manner not as a visa representative like going to a cenote and going into an oxo and then the cashier from the oxo tell me like oh you're George from Stevisa. You fixed my dog. And since then, he's been very much better. He's now healthier. He doesn't go out. He doesn't run. You know, like, and then I think, well, maybe I won't see the end of this soon, but I get to see a change every single time. And that's very exciting. So when we started, Many people told me, you're going to need uh, people donating money because you won't be able to do it yourself. And I thought, yes, definitely. But who's going to believe in me if I've done nothing before? So we have to start. And we have to make people believe in us before we ask for money. So I think when we got to <coughs> around the 7,000th surgery, then people started believing us. Then people started like turning heads and saying, they're real, they're consistent, they are really trying to make a difference. And I'm saying this because most of you uh, are from other parts of the world. And maybe you don't know that much Mexican culture, but we're very um, afraid of giving our money away because usually it doesn't go to the right place. So we have to make people believe that we're putting the money where it belongs, which is very important for me. So these are some examples. And what I always tell people when they ask me, like, what are you going to do with the money that we're donating? And the answer is, like, every single peso that we get goes to surgeries. We do not use the money for anything else but surgeries. We never use the money for other expenses. That's something that I decided I was going to take care of it. So I pay still every single time for plane tickets, car rental, um, hotel, food, everything else comes from my pocket. Every single peso 
that I get from people that make goes into surgeries. And that's very important for me because if you pay for 10 surgeries in pesos, that's 3,800 pesos, you're gonna get 10 surgeries, nothing else. So that's something important to mention because some other times money goes somewhere else and not where it's needed. So we needed to people trusting us we were gonna use their money <coughs> in the right manner. At least it's happening. Um, what is exactly what we do? Every six weeks, more or less, because calendar issues like off days or you know, like festivities or whatever, we have a sterilization weekend. And um, that consists of three days. We start working from Friday to Sunday, and we try to do around 100 and 150 surgeries at least every single day. And that's very conservative. <laughs> Sometimes we do 200 a day with four beds, which is too much. Um, for these, we have um, around 100 um, volunteers that help. Not every single day, but they come and go. So around 100 people, uh, even more, 150 people is with Mr. Lisa working. Um, and with, the, with, with these numbers, we try to do around 4,000 4, surgeries uh, a year, which is uh, twice the amount the government is trying to do. So not bad. Um, only this year, after these 7,000 surgeries and um, the new people coming on board with us, like with money basically, we did two clinics, one in January, one in February, and we did 1,300 surgeries only these two months mm -hmm. in Canasin. That's crazy, isn't it? Um, how do we how do we work? We have various um, areas dedicated to care and attendance. So um, we're adding, as we, as I said, we're always improving. So we added a new area that is called <coughs> peer assessment, where we um, evaluate animals because doing a clinic is very complicated. We get to see and we get all the worst conditions, like skinny animals, sick animals, TBT situations, fleas and ticks everywhere. So if we rejected <coughs> all these animals <coughs> that were in pristine condition, we wouldn't do any. That's the truth. So um, we've been doing a lot with almost no risk to the, to the dogs because of the expertise of the vets. But we have to improve. So this new area is gonna weigh and um, measure like other health measurements to be able to determine if this animal is like in a very bad condition and we won't be able to do it that time. And then do something else like <coughs> try to administer like medicine or getting into condition to address it like next time. So this is new. Reception in this area we try to explain people about <coughs> medicines, the procedure, the risks, the complications, um, and also if they have to pay something, this is where they pay and they sign for the procedure. Anesthesia and pre-op, where they prepare each animal for surgery, we clean, shave, and thoroughly examine them for possible infections, <coughs> bites, or other diseases requiring attention. Um, surgery, and this is the only area I don't like, stress because our vets are amazing. These guys, I think Eduardo has done over 30,000 surgeries in his life. He spent every single day, they all spent every single day of their lives just fixing animals. That's what they do in Mexico, that's what, that's what they do here, and that's what they do every single day. So they know what they do. Um, 
this is important. Why do I bring vets from Mexico City? And that's a question I get every single time. Because I don't know any vets that can do what these guys do. I mean, you have to think that if we do 100, 450 surgeries in one weekend, these are done by four vets. So like every single one of them does more than 100 surgeries in just one weekend. That's a lot. I don't know if you've been to a clinic, but normally this takes like half an hour to an hour in a normal clinic. So these guys do like one surgery every six to eight minutes. That's, that's, the, that's the amount of time we spend. Um, there's, no, there's obviously nobody else uh, willing to charge that amount of money for a surgery. We charge 380 pesos. That includes everything, the bed, the meds, the suture, the anesthesia, so it's impossible to get that here. Um, we also have an area that cleans all the tweezers and knives and everything, so we are very uh, prestige clean for that, so we don't contage, uh, we, we don't uh, contaminate any, any other animals. And after surgery, we have the post-op process takes place in, um, in which a wonderful group of people that I got to meet after like, I would say like the, the third or fourth uh, clinic that we made. Uh, these guys came on board and it's been the best part of it. <laughs> um, this, this is most uh, mostly uh, done by foreigners. Uh, Canada, States, even some of them in London, I think, left, probably. Um, when they first called me, um, Martha is here, she's a friend of my aunt, and she called me one day and she said, I know you do these campaigns, and, and we want to take a, we want to have a coffee with you to see what you do. And um, the first thought was like, how am I going to explain all this in English to them? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> After that, uh, I thought, what's, what's that recovery area? I mean, the dog comes out, he's alive, he goes home. That's it. I mean, what's a recovery area? So um, I went to that coffee, and they told me what they do. And I told them what I did. And they said, I want to, they said, they told me, we want to participate. And I was terrified. I thought, well, they're used to something else, like very, very specific kind of ways. Um, we're more like a rural kind of clinic, very hands on. And I thought they're going to be uh, terrified with our methods, you know, like they're going to run away in a minute but they didn't. And I'm very grateful because they brought to the table a really um, special area. This post-op area is where we got to uh, spread the message about loving and caring for pets because this is really where the people get to sit with their dog and with a person taking care of the dog in a different way they're used to. So when they see a stranger like taking care but with love, like being really aware of the situation, like petting the dog and taking away fleas and taking away teeth and cleaning the, the, the stitches, it's like you can see the people changing like immediately. They, they, they get to see this love and they, they, they take that home, they change. I'm sure, I've seen it. So, uh, this is Martha and Diana. <laughs> These two girls came to change like again for me. Uh, they brought, I don't know, like 70% of the people that works with the series and out came with them. Um, we became a family, a family that cares. Uh, a family that gets together every six weeks and shares 
um, this need of helping. So it's been like really, really awesome. The way um, an idea can become something real from just like wanting to help to having like a whole group of friends, um, a family in Merida that I didn't have. Um, bigger than I ever had. Like, like my family is those three guys that you see in the beginning, and now I have like 150 friends that care, like me, for pens. That's something that I didn't know. I didn't know that that was gonna happen. Um, so this is a picture that we took, I think, a year ago. Um, we are now uh, an association that, although not legally constituted, um, has amazing numerous of collaborator, collaborators. We organize ourselves efficiently through WhatsApp. Um, it's amazing that, obviously, I'm not the person that invented the thread here, or was the one that knew what to do. But like every single person that came to this place and started working with us, kind of knew what they wanted to bring to the table and, and, and knew a way of doing it. And it's been so easy to share knowledge and to go around and um, help and learn from each other that um, it's been super easy to become what we've come after two and a half years. Sometimes uh, we didn't know, uh, we don't know the name of someone like Friday morning and by Sunday, they're like the best worker ever. They want to be here for like, you know, like the rest of the year. So uh, we have performed almost 10,000 surgeries, which means, and that's a real number, that around 200 million unwanted uh, births have been prevented. And that's real. Like every single um, female dog can do that much damage without being fixed. Um, the government recently, and this is the last uh, screen that you're going to see, asked me, how do you do it? And that's why I use this photo, because we do everything that's needed. I've done every single thing that you can imagine, going house after house, knocking doors, trying to convince people to do or to fix their animals because you have to let them know why this is important. And that's something I think not all the people is uh, willing to do. We've been driving around the, uh, the state, we've been knocking doors, we've been explaining people, we have even paid people money to have the dogs fix it. So, what do we do? Everything. Why do we do it? Because we care. And the only thing that we care is about uh, having less animals suffering on the street eventually. Eventually, not. Not animals on the street. So, uh, of course, we are willing to collaborate with whoever is necessary and to share our knowledge because our goal is not just to do more, but to help in any way possible. We are not the kind of organization that is jealous of their procedures. We are willing to help, we are willing to collaborate, and we are willing to do anything that helps. Um, what I asked for is that hopefully there were like 20 other organizations like ours doing the same that we do, and we could see the end of this soon. But uh, that's not possible. It takes a lot of work, so that's not gonna happen. But to spread the word, to let other people know that we exist, to let people know if they want to participate, they can in many ways, like they can go there and help. They can spread the word. They can tell others to go. Uh, they can collect money and pay for strays. So 
there's many, many ways to help. The only thing that I cannot conceive is like, if I see something and do nothing, then we're part of the problem. So what can we do? And we can, we can help like in many, many ways. Um, this is the last slide, and um, I was planning to to see if, well, I'm gonna stay there for my time, <laughs> stop there, stop. Um, to try to see if you have any doubts or like things that I didn't talk about, this is the time to try to uh, solve this question.